welcome to another service here at Church of the Open Bible. We're glad that you could join us online today. We have a couple announcements about things coming up uh, in May and in June, and so I think they're, they're all pretty exciting, and so you can make note of them. So one thing is that we're hoping to have a quip class for specifically adults, but you could probably have some teenagers there and things as well on Sunday afternoons starting in May. So it'll be on Sunday afternoons at 2 o'clock starting the first Sunday of May here at the church. It would be in the fellowship hall downstairs. So you can feel free to sign up at the website if you're interested in coming out to equip class. Michael McFarlane will be teaching that on the book of Titus. Should be really great. So I would encourage you to come on out and, uh, and check that out. Another thing that will be happening in May, the first Sunday of May, May 2nd, is communion. So you can make note of that as well. So that's next Sunday, May 2nd, we'll be having communion here at the church. And so if you're joining us at home, you can uh, have some juice or something like that ready and, and some bread or crackers. Uh, so you can make note of that. And then also, another thing to note is that on June 13th, we're hoping to have a celebration service here at the church. It's obviously been a while since we've had a celebration service and all the details are still going to be worked out because obviously it won't be quite like normal. We won't be able to have everyone all here for one service, but we are planning on having a celebration service. And so with that said, if you're at all interested in becoming a member here at the church or uh, have a child you'd like to have dedicated baby dedication, or if you'd like to be baptized, you can talk to myself or Pastor Jay or any of the elders and uh, we would definitely all be very happy to talk to you about that. And so, uh, yeah, it's really exciting thinking about all these things that are coming up. And it's great to be able to worship the Lord in, in all those ways. And today as well, it's exciting just to be able to worship the Lord as well, just as we, as we always do on Sundays. Uh, get the opportunity to remember the resurrection and worship the Lord because of it. And so let's take some time right now just to, to pray and thank the Lord for that. Heavenly Father, we just uh, thank you that you are so, so great, and you are you're awesome. Lord, you show your faithfulness, faithfulness and your love to us uh, every single day, and for that we are uh, abundantly thankful. Lord, we pray this morning that as we uh, hear the word of God preached and as we sing, that the word of God would dwell in us richly, and Lord, that you would teach us from your word. And also, Lord, as it says in your word, that we would sing. We would sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with thanksgiving in our hearts to you. For we know, Lord, that you are the, the only one who is worthy to be praised, and we want to, uh, we want to praise you, to worship you, and to show just how thankful we are this morning. And so it's in Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. The call to worship today is from Psalm 66. Uh, verses 1 through 8. So it says, Shout for joy to God all the earth. Sing the glory of his name. Give to him glorious praise. Say to God, how awesome are your deeds. So great is your power that your enemies come cringing to you. All the earth worships you uh, and sings praises to you. They sing praises to your name. Come and see what God has done. He is awesome in his deeds towards the children of man. He turned the sea into dry land. They passed through the river on foot. There did we rejoice in him. Who rules by his might forever, whose eyes keep watch on the nations. Let not the rebellious exalt themselves. Bless our God, O peoples. Let the sound of his praise be heard. Hey everyone, welcome to my kitchen and welcome to another children's feature on this Sunday. So parents, if your kids aren't sitting with you in front of the TV right now, then just press that pause button, tell them to come and sit down. We're going to have a great object lesson today. So today, actually, we're going to talk about trust. Trust is a pretty big issue, pretty important virtue to have. It's a pretty big deal. But why do you think that is? Well, because when we trust somebody, we actually depend on them, okay? So just like when we made the decision to follow Jesus, to trust in him, we're basically trusting that he's going to take care of us, that he's going to lead us. How awesome is that? Well, it's pretty cool. But what if he's actually leading us somewhere that's uncomfortable for us, that we're not used to? 
You know what? Sometimes he does do that. But it's not because he's trying to trick us or to hurt us, but rather he wants us to learn to trust him completely. And when we do that, he can take us to greater heights than we could ever imagine. Well, right now I'm thinking of a scripture verse that's going to go along with that. We can apply here. It's from the Old Testament kids, and it's actually written by King Solomon. Where do you think I'm going? You're right. So we're going to the book of Proverbs, and it's Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6, and I want to read it to you right now. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him, and he will make your paths straight. So basically what that verse is telling us is that uh, God will show us which way to go when we trust him completely and we submit to him. So what happens if we stray away? Well, we're likely to fall. And from my life experience, it's just a whole lot better when we stay on God's path. So I want to do just a little bit of an object lesson to help uh, illustrate this very idea. So we're going to pretend that this little ping pong ball is you. And of course, you're trying to live your life on your own power. So I'm going to blow through this straw and see what happens with the ping pong ball. Whoa, that didn't last very long. Let's try that one more time. What ends up happening is that you end up just going in circles. And when you completely run out of breath or completely run out of your own strength, you're going to fall. But now you come to the part of your life where you discover God and you want to surrender your life to him. You're going to put your whole trust in him. Trust him with your whole heart and you're going to let him lead you. So now, here we are. We're going to imagine that God is this hairdryer, okay? So we're going to turn it on and we're going to see where he leads you. Well, let's have let's have you facing the camera, the nice smiley face. When you trust in God, it looks like we stay pretty calm in the Lord. And when you trust him, he'll do some awesome things with you that you couldn't even imagine. Now, God still protects us even when we go a little bit off course. There we go. Now, what happens when we stray just a little too far? That's right, we're going to fall. So it's definitely very wise to completely trust the Lord and to stay on the path that he has for your life. Now, how do we do that? Well, you can do it by reading your Bible. You can also do it by praying, by making wise choices in your life. And of course, listening to God and following his direction. Now, if you stay on God's path and you trust in him, I guarantee you, he's going to take you to higher places than you could ever imagine. So I'm going to use this toilet paper tube. Very nice. I don't know where you guys shop. I shop at Costco. And when we do this, that's actually pretty cool. <laughs> I definitely can't do that with my straw, on my own power. So it seems pretty awesome that we can't go wrong when we follow God with our whole heart. Trusting in the Lord is an amazing and beautiful adventure. You won't ever regret it. So until next time, thanks for watching. Keep spiritually fit and have fun.
Well, as we continue to worship the Lord now through the preaching of his word, I invite you to turn with me again in your Bibles to the book of Ephesians, and we are going to be looking at chapter 5, verses 1 to 21 this morning, as we continue in our series, Life in Christ. Most boys want to grow up to be just like their dads. I still remember the time my dad first took me to his office, and I thought it was the greatest. And I decided right then, I was probably five or six years old, I decided right then that I also wanted to work in an office someday just like my dad, even though honestly I had no idea what kind of work he did. And so I was absolutely thrilled the day he came home with an old briefcase and he gave it to me to use. And I still remember using it a lot. I would fill it with pens and paper, with an old calculator he gave me, snacks. I'd go into the backyard in the fort back there and play office. Uh, Whatever I thought happened in an office, that's what I would do back there. I I wanted to be just like my dad. Well, throughout his letter to the Ephesians, the Apostle Paul reminds believers there and everywhere that God is our Father, that he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, as we read in chapter 1, verse 5. So that there is now one God and Father of all, chapter 4, verse 6. That is all who are in Christ. We now can say, God, you are our Father. Well, as Paul now continues to give practical instruction to the church in chapter 5, he makes the point that we should want to be like our spiritual father, our spiritual dad. That is, as children imitate their fathers, so Christian, so we should imitate God in Christ. And so in verse 1, he makes this clear. This is his main instruction. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. Now, this is the only time in Scripture where believers are explicitly told to imitate God. The closest thing to it would be maybe Matthew 5, 48, when Jesus tells his disciples, you therefore must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Now, that's a tall order, isn't it? To to not just obey God, but to be like God. And yet that's clearly the standard that is being set here. Right? That is ultimately the, the aim, the goal of the Christian life, to be more like God. Of course, in this life, we know we will never reach that, only in the life to come when we see him face to face. But nevertheless, that's the standard. We're to be imitators of God. Okay? Not just other people, other Christians, right? not just Paul, though he, he did encourage the Ephesian believers to imitate him in Philippians 3.17. And, and not just other mature believers we look up to, though he does also tell the church to do that in Philippians 3.18. No, ultimately, we are called to imitate God as beloved children imitate their father. So what exactly does that look like? What does it mean to imitate God? God. Well, Paul goes on to tell us, and he first of all shows us that to be imitators of God, we must walk in the love of God. So verse 1 and 2, again, therefore be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. So the scriptures tell us, as as I'm sure you know, that God is love, 1 John 4, 8. And so it shouldn't surprise us that living like God would mean loving like God, first and foremost. Paul says that is how we are to walk, which I pointed out before is a key word in the second section of the book of Ephesians. It appears five times in total, and most notably at the beginning of each passage we've looked at so far. So in chapter 4, verse 1, we were told to walk a certain way. In chapter 4, verse 17, we were told to not walk a certain way. And now again in chapter 5, verse 2, and then later on in chapter 5, three times we're told to walk certain ways. And you'll remember this was a common Old Testament Jewish 
image of the conduct of one's life, the, the general way we daily live our lives. We might say one's lifestyle. And so to walk in love then means to have a lifestyle that is characterized by love. To, to, it means to, to walk in the way of love, as the NIV translates it, every moment of every day. I like the way that William Hendrickson summarizes it. He says, let love be the tenor of your life. Let it characterize all your thoughts, words, and deeds. Which, of course, is a perfect description of who? Of Christ. Who Paul says here, loved us and gave himself up for us. A reference to how he in love died for us so that we could live in him, which was the perfect demonstration of the Father's love and the purest display of true love the world has ever seen. Romans 5, 8, Paul says, but God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. It's been said that if you really want to know what love is, don't, don't go look in a dictionary. No, look to the cross of Christ because there the world saw love on display in a way that it will never see it again. Perfectly, purely on display at the cross. And what we see there, Paul tells us, is a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God, which is a reference to the Old Testament animal sacrifices that were burnt in the temple to be almost like a kind of spiritual meal for God. And, and they were said, therefore, to be a pleasing aroma to him. You know, as the weather's been getting nicer here and, and I walk a lot, uh, often when I'm walking home from work now, I'll smell someone barbecuing a steak and just this amazing aroma fills uh fills the air, that sizzling steak, and oh, I just, I want a steak so badly. That wonderful aroma, it's so pleasing to me. Well, in the same way, Christ's once and for all sacrifice for the sins of the world on the cross was a pleasing aroma to the Father. It was an acceptable sacrifice. And therefore, when, when we show such sacrificial love, it is also pleasing and acceptable to God. Okay, we're to love sacrificially like Jesus. Who you remember himself said in John 15, 11 to 12, this is my commandment that you love one another as I loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. Church, the heart of true biblical Christ-like love is sacrifice. It's being willing to lay down our lives in love to our friends, but not only our friends, also our enemies. Because of course, when we look at the cross, we realize that it was at the cross where Christ was dying for his enemies in order to reconcile us back to himself, back to God. That's what love ultimately is. It's sacrificially seeking the well-being of others, even our enemies. Dirk Willems was a, a Dutch Anabaptist who was condemned to death in 1569 for his beliefs. But before the execution could take place, he attempted to escape across a frozen lake. Now it was late winter, the ice was very thin, and so it, it cracked and creaked under his footsteps, yet he made it safely to the other side. However, the guard who was chasing him was not so fortunate. The ice gave way beneath him, and he, he fell into the ice-cold water. And he surely would have died if it wasn't for Willems, who heard his cries, stopped in his tracks, turned around, went back out onto the ice, and helped the man out, which then inevitably led to his capture as the other guards came and his eventual execution being burnt at the stake on May 16th of that year. Like Christ, Willems freely sacrificed himself for the good of another, to save his enemy. That is true, biblical, Christ-like love. And that is how we are all called to live 
as imitators of God. And yet so often we live very differently, don't we? Following the way of the world, selfishly seeking to satisfy ourselves rather than selflessly and sacrificially seeking to serve others. And this is especially true with sexuality, where lust rather than love drives so many people today. Which appears to be nothing new because it's the very thing Paul now goes on to address in verses 3 to 4. In contrast to Christ's sacrificial love, he says, but sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you as is proper among the saints. Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place, but instead let there be thanksgiving. Illicit sexual activity was rampant in the first century Roman world, much like it is today which meant the temptation to take part in it would have been enormous for the Ephesian believers back then, just like it's enormous for us today. You know, we look around today and we see this hyper-sexualized society, the society that's moving further and further into just all the depths of perversion. And we think, this is unbelievable. There must have never been anything like this before, right? This is as worse as it's ever been. And yet, that might be true for our own culture, It's not true in the scope of world history. No, the first century Roman world was very much the same. And in fact, if you look historically, you see all of the same uh, sexually illicit activities happening that we see today. In fact, Ephesus was the home of the temple of the Greek goddess Artemis, where cultic prostitution and orgies were regularly associated with her worship. And so it was critical then for Paul to point out that this common behavior in the culture must not be practiced in the church. No, it must not even be, Paul says, named by Christians. Or as the NIV puts it, there must not even be a hint of sexual immorality among them. Do you catch that? Not even a hint, right? Complete sexual purity should be there aim, and ours as well. And yet, let's be honest, so often when it comes to sexual immorality, we tolerate a little bit of it in our lives, don't we? Or or we excuse a hint of it here and there. Or we, we try to get as close to it as we can without actually crossing the line. Whether it's in what we do, as Paul talks about in verse three, or in what we say, as he talks about in verse four. But remember, the standard that has been set here is godliness. We are to be imitators of God, which surely means complete purity and holiness. Not even a hint of sexual immorality in our lives. 1 Peter 1, 14 to 16, he says, As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. But as he who has called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. Right? Again, this sense of purity, not a hint of this should be in our lives. And yet so often we, again, tolerate a hint of it or more, don't we? But think about it like this. Would you and I tolerate a hint of radioactivity on our bodies or in our mouths? Or would we... See, you know, just how close we can get our hands and our mouths to raw sewage? No, of course not, right? We would want to be as pure of those things as possible and as, and as far away from those things as possible. Well, so we should want not a hint of sexual impurity on our bodies or, or coming out of our mouths, right? We should want to stay as far away from that as possible, After all, it is far more dangerous, far more defiling, as Paul goes on to point out in in verses 5 to 6. He says, For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure, or who is covetous, that is an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience." 
Now, hear this. Paul is not talking about believers in Christ here. Okay, he's not saying, look, if you ever fall into any amount of sexual immorality, you lose your salvation, you don't inherit the kingdom. No, that would be completely contradictory to the gospel that Paul has preached throughout all of his letters, and specifically here in Ephesians. Like in, in chapter 2, 8, 9, where he asserts, by grace you have been saved through faith. It is not of your works. Right? He couldn't be clearer. Also, he's absolutely confident that the Ephesian believers will receive their inheritance, as he says in chapter 118 and elsewhere, right? No no sin could change that. Also, if, if he's saying here that, well, you know what? Anyone who ever practices sexual immorality won't enter the kingdom. Well, that would also mean, ultimately, that none of us would inherit the kingdom, right? Because we all fall into this sort of sin and other sin at times. And so rather, what Paul is saying here is that, notice, the sons of disobedience, that's who he's talking about, i.e. unbelievers, that they generally live like this. And unless they come to faith in Christ, they will be excluded from the coming kingdom and experience the wrath of God, right? Despite the empty words of those who would excuse their sin and say, no, 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 that's, that's just a myth. You'll, you won't be punished for this. This, this isn't wrong. Do, go ahead, indulge, do this, right? Those are the sons of disobedience, But we, and the Ephesian believers, have put our faith in Christ, and we will therefore inherit the kingdom of God. And so, and this is Paul's point here, we must not live like those who won't, right? We must not live like the sons of disobedience. We must not indulge in these things like they do. And one way that we can keep ourselves from that, notice, is through thankfulness. Twice Paul equates here sexual immorality, did you notice, with covetousness, which is wanting what is not ours to have. In this case, someone other than the spouse God has given us for holy sexual activity. Thankfulness, on the other hand, is being grateful for what God has given, recognizing that Sex is a gift that God has given to be enjoyed in the covenant of marriage between one man and one woman who sacrificially give of themselves for the pleasure and for the good of each other, which is one way we can walk in love as imitators of God. Later on in chapter 5, verse 25 We read, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. To be imitators of God, we must walk in the love of God, which is the love that has been expressed nowhere more clearly than in the life, death, and resurrection of Christ for us. And when we love each other and give of ourselves to each other, particularly in 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 marriage and particularly in upholding God's design for sex only within marriage, giving ourselves to each other, we walk in love and we look more like God. Amazing stuff. But secondly, to be imitators of God, Paul says we must also walk in the light of God. So verse 7, therefore do not become partners with them, verse 8, for at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. Now the word therefore connects Paul's second exhortation with what he just said in verses 5 to 6 about unbelievers, the sons of disobedience. He says here now, we are not to become partners with them or partakers as the New King James uh, translates it. The idea being that we must not buy into their lifestyle, which Paul says was once ours too, and can be summarized as darkness, living in error and evil. As Paul wrote earlier, you remember in chapter 4, 18 to 19, where we saw a very ugly picture of what it means to be living in darkness hardening our hearts to God and the light of his revelation. Friends, that's how those who don't know Christ live. And that's how we once lived. 
In fact, Paul says here, did you notice that mental and moral darkness, it wants to find us. Paul says, you were darkness. He doesn't say you were in darkness. He says you were darkness, meaning identified with and directed by it, by the error and evil of this world, which is something some of us might, might recall, especially if we were converted later in life, right? It was like walking blind, right? We, we could never really get a grasp of the truth to stabilize our lives. And so we just kept stumbling over and over again over the same destructive old ways, But no longer, Paul says, no. He asserts here, now you are light in the Lord. In other words, in Christ, we are all now identified and directed with the truth and righteousness of God, right? As Paul says in chapter 4, 2021, we now have learnt Christ and been taught in him as the truth is in Jesus. In other words, the lights went on when we put our faith in Jesus. And suddenly, We could see everything for the first time as it really is. We could see truth from error. We could see and and distinguish the right way from the wrong way. And most importantly, we could finally see who God truly is in Jesus Christ. As Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4, 6, For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. That's amazing. And and now that the lights are on, Paul tells us, live in that light. Walk as children of light, which he goes on to explain more in verses 9 to 10. For the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. And try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. So the primary way that we walk in the light is by trying to discern the will of God, to find out what is pleasing and acceptable to him, to discover more truth, which means walking in the light means walking in God's word, because the word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path, Psalm 119, 105, right? The scriptures show us clearly, they they illuminate the right way to go, God's way, so that we can then bear much fruit and grow, and specifically the fruit of light that consists, Paul tells us, in all that is good and right and true. You know, just as physical fruit needs the light of the sun in order to grow and mature and ripen, so Spiritual fruit needs the light of the scriptures in order for fruit in us, the fruit of good works, to grow and mature and ripen. The lights went on in our hearts when we first heard the gospel and believed, but the more time we spend in the word, I'm sure we've all experienced this before, the more time we spend in the word, the light gets brighter and brighter, kind of kind of like a dimmer switch. And, and as it goes on, what do we see? Well, the error and the evil that was in that corner here and under that table there, it's exposed so that we can then recognize it and, and confess it to God and commit to walking in his ways and seeking by his spirit to clean up those areas of our lives. That's what the word does for us. And it's an incredible motivation to be in the word, isn't it? It's not easy. We don't like those areas of our lives that have been kind of in the dark being exposed, but it's necessary for our growth. And we, we see this in, in the Psalms. In Psalm 1, uh, chapter, chapter 1, verses 1 to 3, it says, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law, he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. Now again, talk about motivation to meditate on the word, to walk in the light of God. We will bear fruit, much fruit, like a tree planted near the water, the fruit of goodness and righteousness and truth, and we will prosper spiritually. Listen, if you struggle with being in the word regularly, I just would encourage you, read this passage daily or or print it out and put it somewhere uh, that's very visible. You can just be reminded of the promise that, you know, if I get into the word of God and get the word of God in me, I'm going to bear fruit. That's the promise here. 
I think that's a powerful motivation, isn't it? But you know, that's only one side of the coin. Paul tells us something else happens when we walk in the light. Not to us, but to others, as our light shines before them. We see this in verse 11 to 14. He goes on to say, Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret. But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore it says, Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. So again, Paul exhorts believers to keep living differently from unbelievers. He says to take no part in the unfruitful work of darkness. After all, fruit cannot grow in the dark, and we want fruit, so we don't want to walk in that darkness. We want to walk in the light. But also, he says, we are to expose this error and evil for what it is. We're to to bring it to light. And notice, here anyway, it's not by our words that we do this, but by our walk. Now, certainly, verbal exposure of error and evil is important. It has its place, right? In in chapter 4, verse 15, we were told to speak the truth in love. But here, it's specifically a lifestyle of light, walking in the word that shows up your error and evil. In fact, Paul says, even the shameful things others do in secret are exposed in this light, right? So the, so the growing goodness and righteousness and truth in our lives, well, it, it sharply contrasts with the growing sexual immorality, impurity, and covetousness in others' lives. So that without even trying, what they do and say in public and private is in a sense exposed to them as it's compared to how we're living and, and what we're speaking. And you know, this is one reason why those living in sin, unbelievers and also believers, generally try to avoid those who are living in the light. Why they're so incom- uncomfortable around growing and mature Christians. Because as Paul says, when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible, right? All the darkness and dirtiness there, it it comes to light. Again, as it's contrasted with our very different type of living. So just imagine someone who always walks around in a suit that is covered with really bright LED lights. I mean, I don't think that would ever happen, but just imagine it, okay? Well, every time you would come near them, they would come near you. What would happen? All of the blemishes on your face and your body would be exposed. Or every time they would come into your home, all that light, what would happen is it would expose the dirt and dust that you've never cleaned in the house, in the corners, you know, under the couch, here and there. Would you want to be around that person often? No, you you wouldn't, right? You would try to avoid them at all costs. It's the same reason that those living in darkness generally avoid those who are walking in the light. And maybe we've experienced that before. I know I have to some degree uh, where people who are are living in sin maybe are a little uncomfortable because your life or or our life just is so different and it can be hard. We, none of us want that. We, we want to be accepted and and, and we want to be friends with people, believers and unbelievers alike. But sometimes that can happen. And it shouldn't be a surprise because the same thing happened to Jesus. This is the same reason why so many avoided him. As he said in John 3, 20 to 21, For everyone who does wicked things hates the light, does not come to the light, lest his work should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. So that's the response we can sometimes get when we're walking in the light. But thankfully, that's not the only response. Walking in the light can also produce something else in others. It can bring them to the light. Paul says, for anything that becomes visible is light. In other words, that light actually transforms what it illuminates into light as it leads the person to life in Christ. So that they can, as Paul says here, awake and arise from the dead by faith and that Christ might shine upon them, pour out his blessing and his eternal life. 
Jesus said in Matthew 5, 16, something similar. He says, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Hmm, What a reason to walk in the light. George Fox, the leader of the Quakers, said that every one of them ought to light up the country for 10 miles around because if they all did that, if they all shone for Christ where they lived, then those around them, many would come to embrace the light and put their faith in Christ. And he said, a great shout of praise would go up to heaven everywhere. Isn't that a great image? The same thing should be true for us as we walk in the light as imitators of God, as imitators of Christ, who it was said was the light of the world who shines into the darkness. John 1, 4 to 5. But then thirdly and finally, we see in the final verses that Paul tells us to be imitators of God, we must also walk in the life way of God. So first in verse 15, he says, look carefully then how you walk. Now, the Greek word translated carefully or look carefully here in the ESV, it denotes precision and accuracy. It's the opposite of being careless and casual. Okay, we are to live as Christians with every moment with care. In other words, we cannot live the Christian life carelessly. We cannot leave it up to chance. No, we must be intentional about how we, we structure our lives as Christians. We must give careful thought to how we spend our time and and to what we we do and what we don't do. John Stott helpfully points out that anything worth doing requires care. We all take trouble over the things which seem to us to matter, our job, our education, our home, our family, our hobbies, our dress and appearance. So as Christians, we must take trouble over our Christian life. We must treat it as the serious thing it is. You know, one of my greatest concerns for the North American church today is how comfortable and casual we become about the Christian life. How we often talk about God and his word, uh, the Bible and prayer, worship and witness, just so nonchalantly, it almost seems like it's unimportant. You know, we get far more fired up about sports or about politics than we do about living for Jesus faithfully each day. We can be far more interested and intentional about improving our our body, our, our health, than improving our soul. But in contrast, Paul says to look carefully how we walk as believers in Christ. And then he goes on to give more specifics by pointing out three contrasting ways of living. In verses 15 to 18. So he says, look carefully then how you walk. Not as unwise, but as wise. First contrast. Making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Second contrast. And then finally, and do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. Third contrast. So first, Paul exhorts the Ephesian Christians and all other Christians to not be unwise, but wise, which carries the idea of knowing how to do something skillfully, like maybe a master builder. Okay, when it comes to the Christian life, this means knowing, first and foremost, how to skillfully worship God. Because you'll, you'll know from Proverbs that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, Proverbs 9.10. And more specifically, it's it's about knowing how to walk in God's word. Okay, and not just appreciating it, but applying it correctly to our lives. Proverbs 9, 6 says, Leave your simple ways and live and walk in the way of insight. And Paul tells us here that one way we do this is by making the best use of the time. Literally redeeming the time. Right? Buying it up like a precious commodity so that we may have many opportunities as possible to, to speak the truth and to do good, especially as we consider, as Paul says, that we live in these evil, morally corrupt days. To quote John Stott again, wise people know that time is a precious commodity. 
All of us have the same amount of time at our disposal with 60 minutes in every hour and 24 hours in every day. None of us can stretch time, but wise people use it to the fullest possible advantage. They know that time is passing and also that the days are evil. So they seize each fleeting opportunity while it is there. For once it is past, even the wisest can't recover it. Church, we're to be wise with our time, which begs the question, are we using our time wisely? Do we make the most of every day and every opportunity we're given to do good and live righteously and speak the truth? On his 20th birthday, Jonathan Edwards made a number of very godly and and impressive resolutions. And one of them was this. He said, resolved never to lose one moment of time, but to improve it in the most profitable way I can. Sounds a lot like what Moses said in Psalm 90 verse 12. So teach us to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. But secondly, Paul goes on in, in verse 17 to exhort his readers to not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And again, this is Old Testament wisdom literature language, where we read that the fool says in his heart, there is no God, Psalm 14.1, while the wisdom of the prudent is to discern his way, Proverbs 14.8. This, of course, presupposes the diligent use of the mind. And more specifically, it includes using our minds to study scripture carefully, to interpret it correctly, and then to apply it contextually to the different areas of our lives. And yet, modern evangelicalism, it's sad to say, has in many ways over the past decades supplanted the mind with the heart. So that objective facts from infallible scripture no longer are what primarily guide us, but rather subjective feelings from our fallible experiences. And so something is is good and true and pleasing to God if it feels good and true and pleasing to God, which church is an absolute recipe for disaster, because though feelings can reliably reveal our desires, they do not reliably reveal God's desires for us. Only his word studied with the mind, and yes, with a heart that wants to please him and that is filled with affections and love for him, only that is an accurate guide as we seek to understand what the will of the Lord is. And we see this in Romans 12 too, that says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Right? That's that second contrast, not to be foolish, but to understand with our minds through scripture, the will of God. And then thirdly and finally, and maybe most significantly, Paul says in verse 18, to not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. In the ancient world, many believed that drunkenness could produce possession by Dionysus, the god of wine. His most devout followers would actually seek to yield complete control to him by engaging in drunken orgies as an act of worship. Well, following the rest of the Bible, the Apostle Paul absolutely denounces that sort of behavior as common as it was, and all uh, types of forms of drunkenness. Because why, he says, it's, it's debauchery. Uh, it's, it's reckless, out-of-control living. Well, in contrast to that, he directs believers in Christ to be filled with the Spirit, to allow the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, to take control of our lives rather than wine, right? To be under the influence of the Holy Spirit rather than under the influence of alcohol or anything else. We need to let him have all of us. Fill every part of us. Take complete control. Just think about a 
a sponge tightly held and, and immersed in water. Right? The only way that that sponge can be filled completely is if we let go and allow the water to fill every part of it. Well, in the same way, so long as there are parts of our life that we're tightly grasping onto, I don't want to give control of that area of my life to God. As long as it remains unyielded to the Holy Spirit, we cannot be filled by him. But if we let go of those areas and we yield completely to the Spirit, Holy Spirit, take control of every part of me. I'm completely yours every day. Then he can take control of us and he can do his good work in us. It's very similar to what Paul says in Galatians 5.16 where he says, But I say, walk by the Spirit. Right? Be directed by him and dependent on him. And you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Instead, as he goes on to say, the Holy Spirit will change our lives from the inside out. He'll make us more like Jesus. We'll begin to see new Christ-like attitudes and actions forming in us as we are filled by the Spirit. Which some examples are given here now finally at the end. Starting in verse 19 where he says, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. When we are filled with the Spirit, we will sing to each other and to God in worship. Even if we can't sing, even if we're horrible singers, we just can't help it. I'm so filled with the Spirit. I'm so controlled by him that I can't help but give him praise. Second, verse 20, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father. Right? Spirit-filled believers are thankful believers. Right? We're just overflowing with gratitude for God in every circumstance. And then finally, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Spirit-filled believers are submitting believers. We submit to those whom God has put in our authority. And as he'll later show us specifically in the home. That's what it means to be spirit-filled. But that's the evidence of it when we have given complete control of ourselves to God. And it'll show. It'll show. People will know we're spirit-filled in this way. Many years ago, a group of pastors were discussing the possibility of having D.L. Moody, the famous evangelist, serve as a speaker for an evangelistic campaign they were uh, planning. But one reluctant pastor who was there asked, why Moody? Does he have a monopoly on the Holy Spirit? Well, the question was followed by a hushed silence until one of the other pastors there finally said, no, Mr. Moody doesn't have a monopoly on the Spirit. But it sure seems like the Spirit has a monopoly on him. He was filled with the Spirit and it showed. Now, friends, is that true about you and me? Are we filled with the Spirit? Does he have control over our lives? Does he have a monopoly on us? It's an important question. Because that is the only way to follow Paul's instructions in our text. It's the only way to experience what he's exhorting here. It's the only way for us to truly walk in the love of God, to walk in the light of God, to walk in the life way of God, which is what we want, right? It's what we ultimately should desire. Because again, as children imitate their father, so Christians, we are to imitate God in Christ. That is our high calling as God's children, to look more and more like our Heavenly Father. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. So in closing, I just got to ask, is that what we're doing? Is that our standard? Is that the aim of our Christian lives? To imitate God, to be more godly, to look more like Jesus. When our our midwife first came to our house a few weeks ago to check up on my wife and newborn son, she looked at him and immediately said, oh, he looks just like his daddy, which I was very pleased to hear. But it got me wondering, is that what people would say about me and my heavenly father? Is there a family resemblance there? Can they tell that I'm his beloved child? I think that would be good for all of us to consider. I think that we all would do well today to to take some time and think about that. As we look in the mirror of God's word, do I look anything like my heavenly father? Is there a family resemblance there? When people look at me 
Increasingly, did they see more and more, oh, he's a beloved child of God. That should be our desire. That should be our aim. And it's possible. It's possible because the Holy Spirit is in us. And if we let him take control, he can make us look more like our dad in heaven. More purity give me, more strength to overcome, more freedom from earth stains, more longings for home. More fit for thy kingdom, more used would I be, more blessed and holy, more father like thee. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do want to be more like you. Imitators of God as beloved children. And so we ask now that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit. Take complete control of our lives so that you can make us and form us and shape us more into your image. So that we might walk in love, we might walk in light, we might walk in the life way that you have presented in your word. And in that, Lord, you might be glorified in us and through us. We pray this in Jesus' precious and powerful name. Amen. Before I close with the benediction, I just want to encourage you all again to consider checking out our Open Bible podcast. You can find it on our website. Uh, This week and next week is a discussion that Pastor Joe and I had about the Holy Spirit. Who is the Holy Spirit? What has he been doing in history, uh, in biblical history? And, And what is he doing now? What is his ministry to us in our lives? Those are some of the questions we're going to consider. And I'd encourage you to check that out as the Holy Spirit we've seen Uh, is very prevalent in this letter and throughout the New Testament. So please check that out. But now this may leave you again with this encouraging word of 
blessing and benediction from Paul at the end of chapter 3. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen.